Hi, my name is Heather Vokush, and thank you for joining us on this segment of Witnessing History. Now, we are delighted to be joined today by Lou Popovich, who is the president of the USS North Carolina Battleship Association. So thank you very much for joining us. You're very welcome. Now, you were born in 1927. Can you tell us a little bit about your childhood? Well, it was during the uh, Depression era. I was fairly young by the time the war started. My parents came from Europe. Mother was from Poland, and my father was from Yugoslavia. So I'm a first-generation American. I was 12 when the war started in 1939. It was a depression area, but my father was always working. I really didn't have any strong feelings about being hungry or anything. At that time, were you living in New York? Yes, I was born actually in a story in New York. Of course, in those days, there was no television, so everything you learned was through the radio or in newspapers. You never saw any film unless you went to a movie theater. Before the main feature came on, they always had a newsreel, and it would show us what was going on in Europe and during the 39 and 40. That's the way we got information. goes down the ways. The third ship of her class to be launched from this one shipyard within the year. Months ahead of schedule, too. Typical of the job American shipyards are doing on both the Atlantic and Pacific coasts. At another shipyard, the sponsor's party stands in pouring rain for the second christening. And the heavy cruiser Astoria goes to join the ever-growing United States fleet. Named for the old Astoria, which dealt death to the Japs in battles off the Solomon Islands, the new Astoria is one of the most powerfully armored cruisers afloat. American sea power, striking never-ending blows at the Axis. Well, your father was able to work, and your mother as well. Now, did they work in defense industry kinds of jobs? Yes, my father actually worked in an aircraft factory called Grumman. But before he went there, since there weren't that many jobs on Long Island, he moved the whole family to California, to San Diego. Mm -hmm. And we lived there for about a year, and he worked in an aircraft factory there as a machinist. Mm -hmm. And then I guess my mother wanted to come back to New York because her parents were still living here. And that was a tough decision for her to make. But mm -hmm. we moved back to New York, and then he went to work for Grumman and remained there for uh, 20 years until he passed on. In the meantime, everybody was working in those days. My mother even worked in a bullet factory. And for a while, until she developed a rash because of the brass and had to quit... <laughs> There was a great war effort that was going on while I was growing up in the young, young age. So when you were 12, then you heard that somehow this war had started. Possibly you heard about this on the radio, and right. then you saw some of right. these newsreels. Yeah. And how was it that you came to joining the military? Were you drafted, or did you enlist? Or When I was going to high school... A lot of the people were quitting high school and joining up, and there was a lot of patriotism in those days. People would leave school, and my mother was very adamant about me finishing school, but I wanted to make sure I got into the Navy. Somehow I liked the Navy more than the Army. You'd have to sign up before you were 18, but she wouldn't sign the papers, but my father did. So my father signed the papers, and I was able to get sworn in before my 18th birthday. If you enlisted before you were drafted, then you had more options or something? Or? Right. In those days, you could enlist and uh, select the Navy or the Air Force. So at that point, you're maybe 18 or something, and then you went to boot camp. 
Can you tell right. us a little bit about boot camp? It was located in upstate New York, and we had to go through 10 weeks of training, and it involved making sure you could swim. If you couldn't swim, you'd have to take swim classes. We had firefighting exercises where we had to put out these uh, fires with equipment. There were big uh, vats that were put a fire, and we had to go in and uh, put them out. We had rifle training. We also had to do mess duty. Everyone was exposed to it, plus a lot of rigorous physical training, constant running and marching. I understand you were also exposed to some kind of uh, toxic gases? Oh, yes. They had us put on gas masks and put us in a chamber, all of us, in a very tight quarters. Of course, with the mask on, we didn't feel anything, but then we were told to take the masks off. And they held us in there for at least five minutes before they let us out, just to get the feeling of what gas would be like. It was just tear gas, but uh, it certainly was tearful. How was that for you as, as this young man who had led something well, of a relatively sheltered a, life? It was quite a surprise. You know, I can remember the first night we spent uh, in the barracks. There was like 132 of us in the barracks. One of the young men was just sobbing. We couldn't figure out what was going on, but then we heard a commotion, and medics came in, and they took him out. Apparently, uh, it was too much of a strain for him. It was an experience. Well, I mean, certainly that was, you know, a stressful situation, but then mm -hmm. it got even more interesting. Can you tell us how you went from boot camp, and you were there for around 10 weeks, About possibly? 10 weeks. Okay. Oh, then they did give us five days off where we could go home, mm -hmm. and then we went back to boot camp. And then, of course, they put us on a train. But by then, the war was just about ending, and there was no celebration at all at boot camp. We were just told that the, the war is over, but don't get any ideas. You're just going to continue on with the training, and it's not going to change at all. It's just going to continue on. So at boot camp, you were told that the war was ending, but then you were still somehow supposed to do something else. So can you tell us your transition from boot camp to the uh, battleship? Right. They don't tell you an awful lot. I really got the impression that they were going alphabetically because I noticed that when they put us on the train, we were sent to Boston, and we didn't know where we were going. They didn't tell us, of course, but I found out later that most of the people that went aboard ship on that day all had initials starting with the S, P, Q, R. So we went directly from New York to Boston and were told, climb aboard. You had this difficult 10 weeks, then you're told the war is over, but not really because now we're going to fight somebody else. You're put on a train, you don't know where you're going, and then you came to this massive battleship. Yeah, it was, it was quite a shock to see this. I had never seen a battleship before. We just were told to get on board. Actually, there was now a transfer of the older crew members to the newer ones, and there weren't enough bunks to go around. Well, we carried our own mattresses in our sea bags. It's rolled up on one end of the sea bag, and you just uh, carry it with you with the rest of your clothes. And they said, well, you just put the sea bags down in the mess hall on the deck, and you can sleep there. But we figured, well, maybe we'll... Another fellow and I said, we had hammocks. So we went out on deck and uh, tied the hammocks between a couple of 40-millimeter guns that we slept out one night. But it got very cold, so we didn't uh, spend much time out there. So from then on, I slept in the mess hall on the deck. Can you give us an idea of, of how big this, this battleship is? Like, how many people were on this at one time, usually? We had a crew of, uh, a total crew of about 2,400 men. Of that 24, there were about 140 officers mm -hmm. and about 100 Marines. It was 2,400. 2,400. And, and was it only men? There were no women? There were only, only men. In those days, there were no, uh, no women aboard. Were there segregated units on board? Oh, yes. In those years, there was no integration. And there were black crew members aboard, but I never saw them. They were actually uh, mess stewards for the officers up on the forward part of the ship and had their own quarters, so there was no integration. So you never saw them the whole no, the time you were on the board? Yeah, the so time I was aboard, I didn't, I didn't see them. You were on this massive, massive battleship, and what did you do? What were some of your jobs? We were all uh, given jobs, and mine was in damage control, where I had to uh, uh, get involved in uh, taking a, like a lead line 
and dropping it into uh, there were caps on the deck of the ship and you drop it into the uh, into these voids and measure the amount of water in in these different uh, voids throughout the ship and you make note of this and and it turn the information into the damage control officers and what happens is the ship is uh, as it uses oil it's uh, the water is pumped from one side to the other so that you can maintain the balance uh, we were confined to our own areas and like i never was above the main deck never or down into the engine room you were not not allowed if you went out, outside of where you're supposed to work somebody would holler at you did that get kind of claustrophobic after a while no no you kept <laughs> they kept you pretty busy all day long you had revelry about 6 in the morning or 5:30 and then you work from 8 to 4 and uh 8 to 4 or 5 and then besides that then you had the uh, fire watches at night at 4 hours uh periodically like a 12 to 4 shift or 8 to 12 shift where you have to walk around the ship uh at night and uh, just check the fires and make sure there was no fires aboard did you ever get liberty to be able to go off yes, the ship you could, and uh, they would have liberty groups that would allow you to go off and what would happen if for example you were late in returning or oh, something like that on a battleship it was very strict because uh, there were so many jobs to have to do on a ship mm -hmm. that you couldn't afford to have people uh, miss when it left port mm -hmm. so if you were late coming back you would get extra duty it all depending on the severity of the time or uh, how drunk you got or whatever <laughs> people would end up in the brig depending on the penalty they would put you on bread and water uh give you a meal i think it was every third day but then in the meantime they would uh the marines were in charge of the brig and they would make you stand uh most of the day and, and walk by the uh outside cell door and bang on your fists on your hands if you have if you're hanging on to the door it was pretty intense it was intense yeah. and they would take you down to the mess hall during dinner time mm -hmm. or lunch and have you have the uh, prisoners stand against the wall and watch everybody else eat and then they would hand them uh, three or four slices of bread and march them back to the uh, brig and some of the the guys that were there for a while they were Their stomachs were pretty messed up after a while. I guess they thought twice about <laughs> what they did wrong. I mean, it was very, very intense. I would say yeah. certainly. Now you were on the ship around 1945, and how long were you on on the battleship? Oh, I was only on about a short period of time, uh, only about six months. Okay. So <coughs> now I understand before you got on the battleship. there had been quite a bit of activity i i understand oh, yeah. even that yeah. the the Jap japanese had torpedoed the hull right during one of the uh, battles when the wasp was torpedoed some of the torpedoes that were intended for the wasp went off in our direction and uh, the ship was uh, hit up in the bow on the port side of the bow it punched a hole about 35 feet long and about 18 feet high into the hull but of course the damage control people uh secured off the hatches and uh we lost five men at that point one of them was blown over the side mm -hmm. the others were trapped down below and this is and like 1942 uh, this something was in, like uh, that 42 i guess it was and i understand you also with the ship also sustained damage from friendly fire uh yes that was uh at the time it was some time later uh, when the kamikaze which the suicide planes were diving at the ships uh one came in between uh our ship and the uh Helena which was a cruiser and uh uh both ships were firing at the airplane and one of the shells from the Helena uh, hit in between the stacks of the uh, North Carolina and killed I believe it was five men and injured about 32 but you get those kind of accidents that happen Well, I mean the USS North Carolina is was such an amazingly decorated ship. It was actually the most decorated ship. It carried 15 battle stars, which means that it was uh, involved in uh, 15 major engagements throughout the war. So it was the most decorated ship mm -hmm. in World War II. How did you finally leave the military? How did that come about? 
Well, once again, you weren't told too much. One of the other things we have to do is unload ammunition. And once they decided to bring the ship to New York docks, we had to go out in the ocean and they would bring smaller boats alongside and we would bring all the shells up. You'd have to carry the five-inch shells. They were about 50 pounds on your shoulder. And then the big 16-inch shells, uh, we would just roll them along the deck up to the edge and they would be lifted onto the lighters. When I left the ship, uh, they just told you one day, pack your gear, you're leaving. That was it. We just lined up and were taken off the ship in Brooklyn at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and sent across the street, I guess it was across the street or somewhere, to a receiving station. One of the first questions I asked, uh, how many of you guys have finished high school? So a couple of us raised our hands and they said, okay, you're going to be classification interviewers. Classification so, interviewers. Right. Okay. Right. And so, can I reconfirm before we get into that, all of the guys left the ship at the same time, or they just took out? No, it was certain groups. Uh, I'm not even okay. sure how many left at that time. Okay. Uh, so you'd been on the battleship maybe six months. One day you're told, okay, you can go now. You're right. going to be a classification interviewer. And what does that mean? What did you do? The other thing, you wouldn't even realize where the ship was because uh, when you're working down below, the ship mm -hmm. is moving around. And I didn't even realize we were tied up to the dock at the time. And, and they said, you're leaving, you know. You were tied up to the dock in New York. In New York. Okay. Right. right. <laughs> and had you, had you left the country during that no, six months? No, no. We stayed in the Atlantic Fleet okay. and were up in the East Coast. That's okay. about it. But All you had no idea training. where you were. Right, right. We would end up in the Hudson River and then tooling around the, <laughs> up in the water somewhere. So then you became an interviewer. And what exactly right. does this mean? Well, at that point, uh, so many people were being discharged. They would be coming off ships. They had them come to us and fill out forms. We would ask them questions like, where would you like to be assigned? What kind of ship would you like to be assigned to? And most of them would just laugh at us because they knew that uh, uh, it was really predetermined they were going <laughs> to, someone else had a different idea where they were going. It let us have shore duty for a while and I could get on a subway and actually go home. So periodically I could even get a day off and I'd go home for a while. The fellows I was working with, we said, well, we'd like to get on another ship, you know, to go somewhere. And we went to see this uh, lieutenant, this, a girl lieutenant as a matter of fact, Lieutenant Winchester, I still remember her name. We said, we'd like to get on the ship, you know, and go somewhere. So he said, no, 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 I think you guys are going to be discharged pretty soon, which we didn't realize. Sure enough, one day they said, okay, pack your gear and... And you're out of here. And you're <laughs> out of here, right. And then what'd you do? Try to get into college. The best thing the government did for us was the GI Bill, which involved uh, the government paying for the length of service you are in plus one year. Uh, they would pay your tuition at school. Mm -hmm and uh, $60 subsistence a month. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was able to eventually get into school, spend time at college until I graduated as an engineer. So you became an engineer, and then my understanding is you worked for the same company that your father had worked for. Right. My father had worked for the company for 20 years at Grumman, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually worked f also for Grumman for 30 years, plus another eight years in uh, uh, Texas, which was my first job when I got out of college. Of course, there okay. weren't that many jobs uh, in New York. That's a, a very interesting background, a very interesting history. And now you are the president of this amazing battleship association, right. which is a very loyal, strong-knit group. Can you tell us a little bit about your battleship association? It was created back in 62. And it started out with a whole list of names of guys that could locate throughout the country. Eventually, through work that we did through the Washington archives, uh, we were able to identify how many people actually served on the ship for the six years. Even though the complement was like 2,400, about 7,000 actually served aboard ship. You have reunions every year. We have reunions every mm -hmm. year in the spring. At these reunions, at this point in time, how many crew members come? Well, uh, in 95, we had, for example, 235 would mm -hmm. show up. Now mm -hmm. there's only about almost 20 
that would show up because of all the, that have passed on. And my understanding is that as president, one of your duties is to read the the list of the names of the people who passed right. away the year before in the memorial service. Yes, every year we have a list, and uh, uh, it usually ends up 30 or 40 a year. So our m numbers are diminishing but the, rapidly. <laughs> at least my experience, I can say, is with the men who are in this group, such as Gordon Knopp and yourself, there's really a very tight-knit group and a deep loyalty to the battleship. To the oh yeah, it's, it's yeah. quite a quite a group, and we've known each other, uh, you know, for many years. Mm -hmm. Not having known each other aboard ship, because there were so many people. Yeah, and it's also interesting that the battleship was decommissioned, and it was going to be put into scrap, but then right. people donated money to try to save the battleship, and and one can actually see the battleship now. Yes, they contributed money, and the ship is maintains itself mm -hmm. through. Uh, Admissions and the uh, ship store mm -hmm. where they sell articles of clothing and all. Uh, the state has donated very little toward it. The state has, has donated a little toward it, but it's the people who emotionally identify with what it represents who have supported right. it, right. And, and you and your, your crew members as well. She was once considered the world's greatest sea weapon and went on to become one of the most highly decorated American battleships of World War II. Now moored in downtown Wilmington, she's one of the most highly decorated family attractions in North Carolina, serving a new generation as an exciting, hands-on historical adventure. I can't thank you enough for all of the very interesting things you've shared with us. I have just one more question for you. Um, what, with your background, if you had one message that you would like to share with young people everywhere, what would that be? I think about it when I go to visit the memorials uh, in the national cemeteries. So we had 16 million served in the American military, and they're dying off at a rate of uh, 1,000 a day. And all I can say when I look at those uh, tombstones is that liberty is not free. Liberty is not free. Okay. Right. And when you look at what's going on today in terms of the different wars that are going on and, and all of that, do you see those wars as liberty or do you see them as possibly something else or, you know? Oh, I think uh, it means that we have to keep up our additional strength in this country because it's very important that we do have a strong military. That note, we will thank you again so much for having joined us, Lou Popovich. And we thank you also for having joined us today. Thank you.